everyone. I am your chairperson for this evening's lecture by Dr. Marcy Burroughs. My name is Carl, Carl Watson. Now, I am pinch hidden, that's the truth. So, let me ask a, a question, Kay. In the past, we had established a protocol of singing our national anthem. Is there such a protocol this evening? No? I usually stand up and sing it for everybody who is bashful, but anyway, we recognize our national anthem. I don't want to step on the museum stools. So, thank you all for coming. And we will get things on the way immediately. I would like to express on behalf of the museum our thanks and appreciation for the various sponsors who've made this event possible. This is actually the, these lecture series that I personally have taken part in over many years is a series which is a joint collaborative effort both of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society and the University of West Indies Department of History and Philosophy. My ex-employer and now as a pensioner, the person who puts bread on my table every month. Eternally grateful for that. And the National Cultural Foundation with support from the Barbados Trailway Project. Which, let me put in a, for those of you who may not know, this is one of the fabulous ventures, one of the brains behind it is um, Mr. Barney Gibbs and his wife, of course, who was a colleague from the University of West Indies History Department, Dr. Tara Innes Gibbs. Um, there's so much that we can do on our island and we need these vibrant young minds to establish new directions. So yes, um, read up on the Barbados Trailway Project and support it. Now, the topic of this evening's lecture is, let me read it for you, from invitation to deportation. 70 years of the Windrush generation. And, quote, when I ask, or to put it in Beijing, when I ask someone where they're from nowadays, I expect a very long answer. The culture of diaspora. And this, as I alluded to, will be shortly delivered by Dr. Mercer Burroughs. And I myself, like you, look forward very keenly to Dr. Burroughs' discourse. I've known Dr. Burroughs for quite a long time. And there's a blurb here, I will just pick and choose from it. But to me personally, what does Dr. Burroughs mean? Dr. Burroughs has one of these bubbly effervescent personalities. You know, she bounces from here to there, she's eager, she's full of energy, and she's a creative. So that means that, and I put myself in the list of creatives, that means that she and I share some degree of eccentricity. And that's what makes us really interesting people, to be slightly eccentric, you know? We don't want to be cut, ordinary, run-of-the-mill people. We want to stand out and be different. And Dr. Mercy Burroughs certainly stands out. She, of course, got her doctorate in cultural studies from the University of Warwick. And she's won a number of awards, including the Earl Barrow Memorial Award. And she also got a Commonwealth Scholarship. She was also granted the Level Home Visiting Fellowship to the UK, enabling her to be resident in the Centre for Caribbean Studies at the University of Warwick. Um, Dr. Burroughs conceptualised and developed a, a seminal 
area of studies at the University of the West Indies, um, cultural studies, a master's program, which she has directed for a long period of time, played a, a, an important role in that. Um, and I can also mention that at the same time, when I was introducing a similar program, a master's in heritage studies, um, Marcia was exceedingly helpful to me. And we both had that vision of opening up new areas of endeavor and study for the Barbadian. Her research interests are many and varied. They include cultural practices in the Caribbean. And from time to time, we do share, she will pick my brains on my knowledge of Obia. Now, I don't want anybody in the audience to think I am an Obia practitioner. But I do know quite a bit about the subject. And from time to time, Marcy will come and pick my brains on, on various things, to which I have absolutely no objection. So without further ado, let me now ask our guest speaker for the evening, Dr. Marcy Burroughs, to come to the podium and inform us on all these aspects of the culture of diaspora related to that much debated area of concern for us today, the Windrush generation, when so many of our predecessors packed their bags, donned their best clothes, and went out in lighters to those vessels in Carlisle Bay and other bays throughout the West Indies on that long transatlantic voyage, looking for what Dick Whitton found or did not find, that pot of gold on the streets of London. So Marcy will tell us all about the ups and downs of that brave generation who sailed off into the bright yonder. Marcia, the floor is all yours. Break a leg. I neglected to, to inform she's an actress. Remember, laugh it off. Can't want better. Come up, my dear. Let me be a gentleman. I'll hold your hand. Good. How often do we get to say Dr. Watson, I presume? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, I am aiming for an interactive presentation this evening. We have a number of PowerPoint slides labeled voice. And I'll be asking any member of the audience, male, female, if you want to read the voice, please do, because the focus this evening is on the voice of stories that we've been told by those who have traveled from Barbados to the UK and returned, or who've opted to remain in the UK, or who live between the two. But I want to begin with a voice from 1799. 1799. Accordingly, we presume a gentleman named John Ford, who is identified as a white Creole, posed the question to an enslaved female in Barbados, more or less, where are you from? Now, according to acknowledged scholarship, we could presume that the response of this enslaved female was that she should be from Barbados. After all, she's enslaved in Barbados. She may have made reference to the parish in which she lived, or she would have made note of the plantation in the parish on which she lived. In other words, her immediate reference point would be the island colonized space of Barbados. And, and that would be because scholarship continues to promote the discourse that Barbados lost, the African Barbadians or those of African descent lost their culture that we are a successfully, successfully colonized English space, arising with the construct of Little England. But this enslaved female responded with really a very long answer. My congratulations and appreciation goes out to Professor Jerome Handler, who had recovered this narrative whilst working in the Bodleian. He has published it, so it's online in the Barbados, in the Journal of Slavery and Abolition. And in 1999, which is now, what, 20 years ago, he requested 
that I voice the narrative. And when I say that to my students who are 20 years old, first year, I have to explain what a tape recorder is because there's this vision of, what? Well, it's a tape that you put in. <laughs> so it was done on a tape recorder in my dwelling at the University of Warwick. But it's a very haunting narrative. And it's online. It's a narrative of Sybil, spelled S-I-B-E-L-L. -L. And we are going to listen to it. Um, hopefully it comes up. We, we are trying our best. We have great many slaves, a higher many men. One among battles was a great man in the front in my country. My daddy never won. He has grown two, three miles long. I heard so many men that he put the bundles in large trucks for them. Let him cut, honey. He fell three, four barrels. He has so much. Money. When you want to go drink in my country, we go and cut the tree and the juice will run and keep something with that good, strong drink. I'll be ready for the my sister. And she went out to the house one day and let me alone. And, and my mother-in-law come in and tell me about it. So he's going to carry me to see his other wife. He tell me and carry, 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 carry me all night and day, all night and day, away from my country. It me meet a man, and the man knew my daddy and all my family. Ah, brother, you beg pardon for calling you brother, master, but you see me here now. But there has been grand fight in my country for me, for he will carry my family. As my brother-in-law carry along, we hear great noise, and we wonder, but he can be no fun. And he carried me to a long house full of me, they were stalking and making sense. But very few of them were in my country. My brother in law sent me to the back of the people. We never see the white people before. We never see the great ships on the water before. We never hear the words before, which frightened me so much either that me taught me were dying. My brother in law took up the gun and he pulled out the sand before. I wanted to get away from me, but me wanted to cry. And he stopped with me to the poor town. Then he was away from me. He said, let's keep me in there a long time. I'm going to go to the tree every day to the long house with food. There have been many black people there, very bad man. They talk all kinds of country. And tell me all that we go to a good master yonder, yonder, where we were working, working with a knee and, and messy, messy, grandy and no fun fun. We know the body in the house. But then we go in the ship, we find the country woman in the world, the country man in Dublin, country woman Sally, and some more. But it's all them all about. They don't stop me where now. When you ask someone where they're from, nowadays we expect a very long answer. This quote comes from Stuart Hall, reflecting on the process of Windrush migration and reflecting on his own experiences. Um, Professor Hall, he passed a few years ago, I would say that this is a story that has been repeated and repeated. I'm just curious, has anyone before heard, have you heard of this narrative for Barbados from Sybil? Has anyone heard of it? It's on, that recording is online. We do not know why Mr. Ford chose to record, to write what she said. We do know it's dated 1799, so it's diasporic. 
Would anyone like to share some of the things that she said? Were you able to listen? She was, sorry, go ahead. I'm gonna walk around. I can't see. Her experiences, she says she was born in a space called Makarundi. We haven't been able to locate Makarundi yet, but it seems that she was very fond of her sister. And one day she went to her sister's house and the brother-in-law duped her into going with him. It's a story that's very familiar to those of us who've read about narratives of enslavement, the slave trade, forced migration. So she travels with the brother-in-law quite willingly and he takes her, it seems, to the coast and there he exchanges her for guns and leaves her there. And then she goes into, I've never seen ships on the ocean before. I've never seen white people before. She couldn't understand the languages around her because the other enslaved Africans were from many different spaces. But she stayed there for quite a while. And then those of us who study migration or history, by now we know what will happen. Unfortunately, she will be packed into the bottom of a ship. And she travels across what Professor Handler calls the Eurocentric Middle Passage. But for her, it's just traveling, carry. So she speaks of carry, carry, carry. The brother-in-law carried her. And then she sailed over. By the time she reached Barbados, she had recognized um, two individuals from her own group. But she says, but we scatter all about now and she hadn't seen these individuals since. As I said, that was taped on a small tape recorder. Reading it as an actor is very haunting. She came over as an elderly lady, as Professor Hanlow says. We have no idea of her age. She seems to be recounting her narrative after. We do not know if she said this narrative before, the culture of diaspora would say she probably has shared the narrative before. The person recording the narrative only makes his presence felt in the end. He suddenly shows up in the middle of in the end of her speech and says, and she broke down crying. Otherwise, it's written in what is called English Creole. What makes the narrative stand out? We've only thus far located 15 enslaved narratives in total, including Equiano, which speaks to this journey in process. And only two of them are in English Creole. Both are from Barbados. There is another one by a lady named Ashi, who says she's from the Fante group, and she's really angry when she records her, her narrative. So, Jerome Handler gives more focus to Sybil because Sybil's narrative is so rich. He does say, and may I quote him so I don't misquote him. Here we have an example of what scholars would call forced migration and certainly Sybil traveling with her brother-in-law on what seemed to be like an evening out turned into a story of horror. We do not know where or what was Makarundi, but her story blends well with other narratives captured by enslaved Africans. We do know, for example, that it does not attempt to straddle all of the narratives to say this is what all enslaved Africans went through. Millions and millions of Africans were enslaved, but it does capture that early experience. And for us tonight, I wanted to begin with it because it humanizes these enslaved peoples. So the process that we have been going through for weeks here in the museum, we can imagine that that's the process that enslaved Africans went through when they reached the shores. Maybe they passed on the stories as Sibyl did. This is what happened to me. I was with this person, maybe she told her grandmother the stories. Maybe the second and third generations kept the stories going. 
Unfortunately, what has happened is that this is rarely recorded. And this is a very rare um, example. But it makes us think 200 years later, 2019, the very process we're going through collecting the memories, and I will take you through quickly here, has been ongoing for quite a while. What do we do with the narrative of civil 200 years later? How do you, and this is an interactive session, so these are not rhetorical questions. Any comments? We have a narrative of someone who's enslaved in Barbados and who has left us a memory. What would you suggest we do with it? Professor Handler is hoping that we can disseminate it in schools that the population can speak to stories of migration? What do you think? I see some nods. <laughs> yeah. Are you stunned? I did play this at a primary school a few weeks ago during African Awareness Month, and one of the individuals asked me, how do I know it's real? And I said, I don't know. Um, it's unusual. It challenges stories of migration for Barbados. And it has been published. It is by a scholar of great renown. So we don't know if Mr. Ford made it up. He just decided to write it down. We don't know. But we have it. And it makes us, I hope, start to think of these enslaved people's it's their memories because 200 years from now, maybe there'll be a gathering in what would be 20, 22, 20? And they'll reflect on what you've been doing for the past weeks about the stories of migration. So I just threw that in for us to think about when you ask someone where they're from, we never know what's going to happen. Thank you. So that's the first component of my presentation. I have two other components. The second component we will refer to the slides. However, I want to read a voice for you that I don't have on the slide, but then I will be inviting you to read other voices. The voice goes, I came up poor, and I wanted to help myself and better myself, and I went to England, and I come back now. I am not rich, but I could put a meal on my table. This is the first volume of a series entitled Collecting the Memories, which features the testimonies of Barbadian migrants who traveled to Britain between 1942 and 1970 and lived there until the early 1990s and then returned. All but two of our interviewees resettled on the island at the time of their interviews and may we say we were very new in the process of collecting the memories. And it's only when I started to chase the persons who we had spoken to that I discovered two persons that were actually visiting. So I had to travel to England to collect their images as they lived in London. And one lady actually lived in Bradford. But we never thought of when we began the process. We didn't think this is an ongoing process and individuals are traveling back and forth. The majority had occasionally journeyed back and forth between Barbados and Britain, reconnecting with their various manifestations of home. Yet central to their experience of the vast majority was the determination to return to Barbados and recommence their lives in their native land. The migration project was the brainchild of the migrants themselves. In 2003, that's where we began this process of collecting the memories. These individuals were ahead of their time in their insistence that as those who had migrated, they wanted to speak to their experiences and their memories of both Barbados and Britain. And they especially requested that the questionnaires for the interviewees give focus to their lives in Barbados prior to migrating, as these migrants strive to demonstrate that their migration experience was part of what they saw as a continuum and it was integral to the formation of Barbadian and Caribbean identities. Further, these individuals requested that their voices be foregrounded in the text as they shared their visions of migration. 
with the number of texts in circulation at the time, with several references to experiences of Caribbean migration, our interviewees felt that they were excluded from the text. That was then. There have been many texts that have come out since then that have incorporated the voices or attempt to, but at that time, most of the texts were very focused on quantitative results, as in statistics. In 1950, so many, so many hundred moved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They focused on the voice. They openly wanted their narratives to be heard and that the readers reflect on the visual as well as the text. In doing so, these interviewees granted us access to their memorabilia of migration, again, ahead of the Windrush call of last year. They gave us their passports, they gave us travel receipts, and they gave us photographs of everyday life and of their experiences. The majority saw their journey to Britain as part of the mantle of struggle for Barbadian working classes and poor, whether it was in the sugarcane fields or whether part of the post-World War II migration to Britain. One interviewee had joined the war effort during World War II and treated his migration as his duty to empire. His process of migration began in 1942 and that date, 1942, signaled the start of our text of collecting. And can I have the first slide, please? We do not have the clicker, so I'll have communications. This is the voice of someone who observed the process of migration. And this is what they had to say. When other voices come up, please feel free to read. Would anyone like to read this? It is a male voice. It's reflecting on the culture of migration in Barbados, that pe persons were always migrating. Would anyone like to read it? Yes, go ahead. Sorry? You're volunteering someone. Who are you volunteering, Dr. Watson? I think someone has volunteered someone. I volunteered Theo. Oh, Theo needs to read it. Oh, um, Theo, would you like to go to the microphone? This is our interactive session. We have several voices to be read. Yes. You're speaking of someone you knew who traveled a lot. So it's he went. Culture of migration. He went, first of all, to Curacao, working with Shell Oil in Curacao for five years. He came back, spent about a month or so, then he went back and then he stayed there for another year or two. Then he joined the Harrison Line to Liverpool. He would hardly be away for more than six or seven months. He would come in for a week or two and then join another Harrison Line and go off as far as South Africa. Thank you. So, <laughs> yes. I, I was struck by hardly, word hardly. He would hardly be away. I was, yeah. I wasn't sure. Yes. He would say hardly be away. Yes, it was so continuous. What is being captured there is that migration was a continuous process. And this particular gentleman would go where the work was located. So he would hop the ship and go, go to Curacao. And in many of the narratives we see, many Barbadians, for example, are in Liverpool because they hopped the ship to go to Liverpool and then stayed. So if we can imagine a process of migration where it was every day, someone was going somewhere. In 2019, perhaps, it seems distant because we are more accustomed now to being in Barbados and fixed here, but in the 1940s and 50s, we were on the move, continuously on the move. So in this way, migration to Britain post-World War II was part of the process of work for the Barbadian, and hence their journey to Britain was yet another step in the enduring narrative of the Barbadian struggle to persevere, looking for work despite adversities and to live their lives. Yes. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I can see you. That hardly is in comparison to the 4th of 
five years in, in the second night, and then he went with to spend with another one, he went back next day for another year or two. So okay. they're contrasting the five to six, seven months trips on the Paris of night. There's a longer migration stage, and in a sense, there's an implication that working on a Carson night is not so much migration as it is work traveling to and from work. Yes. Because migration has a sense of staying for an extended period, more than like four days or two months. Yeah. But there is something I believe my co author spoke to where Barbadians left with the impression that they were going for only five years and that there was this culture of only five years. So at the time, my staying for 30, 40 years was not a part of the process. You were going and returning. So six months you go and return or two, two years you go and return. I'm trying to, as we say in history, try to exert ourselves into the space of the happening. So in the 1940s and 50s, it seemed to be a regular process, go on a ship and return. This person then, so this person kept going back and forth. One of the things that we are wrestling with, I am wrestling with, is what exactly is the meaning of only going for five years? Has anyone ever else heard someone say they only went for five years and then they stayed 40? Have you heard that statement? Yes? What did you understand by it, please? Was it someone, your grandfather, or someone who journeyed only for five years? No one willingly left to stay for more than five years. At that time, that was the one of six. There are some people who left and said, I will never come back to five years. So that's a different group of people who felt that five years. I may say that when we began the process of collecting the memories, uh, Mr. Larry is a part of our collection of memories. He has um, memories and we have images that Mr. Um, Larry has shared with us of a very young gentleman who was a bodybuilder, I believe, and really a bodybuilder, um, who then journeyed to, to the UK. He shared with us his wedding pictures. So it will be appearing in the book called Collecting the Memories. Thank you, Mr. Barry. So I'm aware I have got 45 slides and I only have an hour, so I will turn to the slides. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes, um, I removed the names, but the females that we interviewed, they traveled between the years of 1955 to 64. I have left the dates, however, because I'm fascinated as I continue to research do research on migration, individuals can tell me up to the date, the exact date of when they left, or the, the date they arrived. So someone certainly left on the 14th of August, 1966. Someone left on the 30th of August, 1964, 62, sorry. Someone left on the 7th of August, 1964. And I'm fascinated by that, that process of remembering. You remember the date. You either remember the date you left, and or you remember the date you arrived. Can you have the next slide, please? For the males, the same thing. We have our individual who left in 1942, and we have his voice. He went off to work in the war, but then our other individual, he left on the 21st of December, 1954, and we have his voice as well. So these individuals remembered or remember the date they left. Can anyone here? Um, remember, uh, you have a uh, member of a family who remembers the day they travel. Would you like to share it with us? Or anyone who's themselves a migrant who's returned to Barbados? Second of September, Second of September 1970. Yes? 20th of? 20th of August. 
10th of August, 1963. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, buddy, buddy. Mine was the 5th of November, 1963. Yeah, there is, buddy, the 5th of November, 1963. Anyone else? Yes. Gray clothes. Okay. I'm curious. Can you possibly think of why you remember the, the date? Why is the date inscribed in your mind? Was it the first time you traveled to you? No, no, no. A major decision. Yes. And so the date. I am fascinated by that. And as I continue when I speak to individuals, there's someone who's 90 in Reading and she told me the date. And she returns to Barbados quite often. I caught her when she'd just come back from Barbados. Okay. Keep, keep an eye on my slides. Yes, please go to the next slide then. <laughs> um, Slide again, please. Oh, there's a, well, I can read in between if needs be. Oh, we're having a quiet pause. So what I'm trying to show you is a process of collecting the stories. The focus we gave, we did not, we just made an open call. Who wants to share our story, their stories with us? And so it's called a snowballing effect. We took and recorded the stories. Essentially, we covered individuals who lived in 10 of 11 parishes in Barbados. Um, we found that one person would say to another one, there is this project that the university has, why don't you come and give them your story? And that's how we kept going. It meant, therefore, that we had persons who went all over Britain. We do have someone who traveled to Scotland, and her paramour followed her and married her promptly within a week. So the reason for our migration was, he said straight up, love. And they're still married 40 plus years later. So she was migrating, she wanted to be a nurse in Scotland, he followed her. And we have that lovely love story. I believe the, the slides coming up will be speaking to questions of why did you migrate? We captured um, stories as in, for example, there was little employment on the island. So you kind of did whatever you could. Migration became a way out. Our migrant who was in World War II happened to receive an envelope which was delivered by a policeman, which frightened him at the time. If a policeman delivered an envelope in the 1930s, 40, it was presumed that you had committed a criminal act but actually the, the envelope was from the British government inviting him to Queen's Park. And we have his voice which, in which he says, I sat there and I was asked, do you want to represent queen and country? And he agreed to go with 11 other Barbadians and was torpedoed twice on his way up to England, twice very lucky. He ended, um, just blisters in, in Iceland and then he joined the war effort in Manchester. So the slides of why did we migrate? Ah, here we are. I will be showing very few photos, but this is one that we will travel through. This is Phyllis Warner. Would someone like to read her story? Please. Female? Female voice? Yes, I thought I saw a hand. Well, Phyllis says, I was born in Lyon Castle, St. Thomas, on the 6th of December, 1929. My mother, Miss Beatrix Gaskin, and you know in those days my mother was a laborer. I went to Holy Innocence Girls School, St. Thomas, and after leaving school, I came into town to my aunt, Miss Rowe, and I stayed with her for quite some time. Let's, next slide, please. They asked, me, they asked me if I wanted to be a nurse, work on the buses, 
in the hotels or work for London Transport with the trains. I wasn't sure, but then they put me down for London Transport. I leave here 25th November 1957. This is the only image that we've gathered of Phyllis. The only image. So I will be bringing Phyllis back later on in the discussion. Um, she's the lady who worked out that if she, one of her jobs was pressing shirts, and she worked out that if she pressed 36 shirts, 36 shirts a day, nine of those shirts would go to remittances. So she calculated her remittances, as many migrants did, to what was needed to ensure that they were able to send some money home, as well as pay for accommodation, as well as pay for food, as well as pay for transport. And so as she pressed the shirt, she worked out nine shirts a day. Next slide, please. They believe it's a male voice. Would someone like to read this for me, please? This is a strident voice of a migrant who is still alive. Very strident. Theo, would you like to go again? <laughs> I had hoped that he would join us here tonight. He isn't able to join us, but this is his story. I'm going to, I'm going to send you an invoice. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I used to tell everybody, if they're living or they're dead, they had to pass by me because the school was just down the road. The church was beside the school, the drugstore which we called the dispensary at that time, it was a little way from that. Further up was the almshouse. You must have heard of the almshouses and the post offices, and then the rectory was halfway in the hill, and the doctor was on top of the hill. So in that little district, you had practically nearly everything. Plus, there were a couple of shops, a rum shop opposite, and so on. He's describing St. Joseph, and actually Horse Hill and the immediate environment, environs of Horse Hill. And he says, the rum shop, as a little boy, he was only allowed to go there when he was an older little boy, and that's where you were taught to be a man. This voice, the person who owns this voice is still very much alive, and hopefully when we have our launch, we'll be there to join with us. Slide, please. Thank you, Theo. This is also a male Barbadian speaking of the process of migration, of what was organized with Synagogue Lane. Have we heard of Synagogue Lane? Yes, would someone like to read it, male or female? Or is my audience busy reading? <laughs> I went to work in Synagogue Lane. I think I have it right. I went to work in Synagogue Lane, and that was again a recruitment of people who were going to this time to England, London Transport, Lions Tea Shop, and nurses. And my job was to set exams for people who were going on London Transport, people who were going to be conductors, first of all, and had to do some mental arithmetic and quick change making and whatnot on the buses. This individual is still alive, and this individual has a very interesting story. They worked with the process of recruitment in Barbados and then traveled to the UK and worked in the Barbados High Commission in the UK with individuals who had migrated and they returned to Barbados and worked with what becomes the returning nationals policy. So they worked in all of the spaces in that triangular, triangular spaces of the migration process and yes, still alive and hopefully will join us when we launch the book. Yes. Next, please. This image is a GIS image that GIS gave us permission to use their images quite a while ago. And these, this interview is taking place apparently in Sewell Airport. Yeah. And do we recognize this gentleman? A very young version of someone who is very prominent in GIS. Sorry? Oh, would you like to say that again, Andy? Gladstone Hoja. <laughs> I'm not sure Andy said Gladstone though. What did you say? Big mouth. 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 Big mouth. Okay. Gladstone Holder, aka Big Mouth. The mouth. Okay. Right, next slide, please. <laughs> 
Yes, and again, this is speaking to the process. Mr. Guy Perry was an Englishman, and he was in charge of the Labor Department in those days. He opened the door and invited. So this is, I'm sorry, this is our migrant who was going in World War II in 1942. He's made to wait for a year. So he's appeared in Queen's Square, as he's been required to do, and he's recounting his memory. Mr. Guy Perry was an Englishman and he was in charge of the Labour Department in those days. He opened the door and invited us into Queen's Park. All of the um, prospect soldiers who had gathered and we sat along a long table and he got on the platform and he held forth then alleged saying that the war was on and how the mother country was at war and she didn't need soldiers. What she needed was ammunition to fight the war and she needed people who could make the ammunition, and we were invited. He was inviting us to go to England to make the ammunition. We would be trained as engineers in a technical school. We would be provided with the housing and with money, and after training, we would go into the factories and make ammunition. It continues. Can we go to the next slide, please? And he said, young man, will you go and fight for your king and country? And the young man said, yes. The second young man, young man, will you go and fight for your king and country? The young man said, yes. He went on to the fifth man and said, young man, will you go and fight for your king and country? And the man said, I would like to consider. <laughs> Which is an interesting twist. Eventually, they all agreed. But they were made to wait for a year before the boat came to take them first to Bermuda. On their way to Bermuda, it was torpedoed because they were in the open. And he recounts his narrative, he recounts seeing mattresses and all the bits and pieces of ships floating on the water. They're then transferred to a ship at New York. And on their way, they're traveling in a convoy. It's World War II, they're easily spotted and they're bombed again. The boat he was on, the pilot steered clear of the spaces that were being bombed and they continued. A fascinating story and to my knowledge, he is still alive. And he has published his story, by the way. Thank you. Next slide, please. Right, so what were the conditions in Barbados that our migrants have spoken to? Definitely lack of employment, limited choices of employment, poverty, many narrative books for the poverty of the 1950s, early 60s. There was this thing called apprenticeship apparently where you would be an apprentice and not be paid. So one of our migrants worked for a tailor for three years and was never paid. The need to support families, many individuals made that decision. Very limited opportunities for education. If you were not of a certain class or color, my mom left school at 14 and went to work. Her family could not afford for her to, to pay for her to go to secondary school, as happened to many individuals at the time. There were many barriers to advancement, many social, racial barriers to advancement for persons of color in Barbados. And there were many social cultural practices. What I didn't list there was that some individuals left for a sense of adventure. That's what we captured. Um, Theo, I will speak to you and I will also speak to the other persons who migrated. Why did you migrate? Uh, I personally. You personally? I have personal reasons. Personal reasons for migrating. Okay, yes ma'am, why did you migrate? Lack of employment. Okay, in 1963. Would you like to share your age with us when you left? 18 and a half. 18 and a half, so looking for opportunities, yeah. thinking of family life, adulthood, and someone, family home to support. Yes, ma'am, I remember you also. Mike, when did you, why did you migrate? Excitement and adventure. At excitement and adventure. Get yeah, away from the malicious people. <laughs> Small island politics. <laughs> Buddy, why did you migrate? Why? why? Yes, why? why? I, I migrated because what you said earlier about apprenticeship. 
Those are the stories that we've received as well. Does anyone else want to share their stories of their family's migration? Dr. Yeah. Barnes? Yes. Um, social media side on the, what would be your right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we have a few um, comments from yes. the voices online. Thank you. And we have from Megan H. When you were asking about the period when persons travel, mm -hmm. she wanted to share her story. Go she ahead. She said that she left Britain, she left Barbados and arrived in Britain in 1971, and she will never forget the date because it was the year that Britain changed to the decimalization, which meant that the conversions of money were a lot easier for her coming from the dollars and cents Six. that she has in Barbados and okay. still have. So that was from Megan H, and she's watching from the UK right now. We okay, also have persons hi. joining us from New Jersey. And we also have a gentleman, Michael C, who wants to know what of our migration to Guyana. That's his question that he posed. Yes. There's actually someone who's just completed his PhD thesis on migration to Guyana and to Brazil. So that work is undergoing again. It's Mr. Frederick Allen. He's with the history department at the University of the West Indies. Hopefully then he'll be able to publish his findings. What I can quickly say is that he's discovered that as soon as 1838, immediately after emancipation, Barbadians started to migrate females and males. They would take a boat and go. What has happened as a result is that we have the official migration statistics to Guyana, which do not capture the movement of someone taking the boat and going. So I believe that part of his work as he moves on will be recapturing through the stories. He's found individuals living in Guyana who says, yeah, my, my great grandmother always said that she took the boat and left da da da. So the experience of Guyana is again to be recaptured. Please also understand that Dr. Walter Rodney did seminal work on migration to Guyana as well. What Mr. Allen is pursuing now is updating that work through the voices. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you. Let's have the next slide, please. So a female voice, would anyone like to read it? It speaks to what she was doing and why she chose to migrate. Any of our young ladies there? No volunteers? Yes, I, yes, come. Thank you. It's an interactive session. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Well, I used to clean chairs. I worked two places. I worked at Penn's, the dentist, and I worked at Solomon Laundry before I left here. You won't get no money here in caning a chair like every Christmas so you can get a cane chair. You get chairs to cane, and during the year, then what? You would get one or two, you know. Different people would give you a job caning a couch or anything so. Thank you. And she moved to a space in the UK and became very prominent. But that's in demonstrating the need to leave, no, ch no choice, especially for females, what was available for them. Thank you very much. And your accent, yes, you are second generation. Third generation, born in Britain. Thank you for joining us tonight with your friends. Yes, let's have the next slide, please. We'll come back to you. I'm not going to let you go so easily. Yes, this is a gentleman speaking about his mom and the lack of employment for females. Would anyone like to read it? Okay, we're not having the immediate response. So he remembers she mother did work. 
In those days, employment was very difficult for women, for men as well, if you were not, say, a mason, a carpenter, or something like that. There were very few opportunities outside that for ordinary men and women, and for the females, I am talking about the ordinary working class females. If you did not work in the sugar fields, then you would look at things like working in people's homes as maids, and those kind of things, such as caning chairs. So very limited work for especially females. Yes, please, next slide. This is a gentleman who spoke to why he migrated, and it's very interesting what he says, what was required as a blacksmith, and what was required at the factory. Would anyone like to read it, because it continues? Yes, please. Yes, I'm not being gender specific. I could be accused of being gender specific. Please go. Thank you. My voice sounds like a real voice tonight, so that's it. Go for it. So I went to the blacksmith trade because in those days, it was blacksmith or carpenter. But I went to the blacksmith trade. I put on a pair of overalls and a pair of power boots. I was learning to be a blacksmith, but then there was no work. Blacksmith didn't have any work. I learned to mix the boots, that's all. And then... Next slide, please. My mother said, you're just wasting your time. And she had a friend at a factory, and she said, go and learn to be an engineer at a factory. So she sent me to a friend who was working in a factory to learn to be an engineer. And my friend took me to the factory to learn to be an engineer. And all I had to do Next slide, please. was give me. And I had to wipe the engines down and oil them and things like that. That was learning to be an engineer in those days. I did that, and they paid me six pence a day. Thank you. Yes, all of this work. So he was speaking to the futility of what he was being given to do. He went on to work as an engineer in the UK. So he was able to expand his horizons and do what, explore other aspects of his life. But at the time, that's what he was put to do, clean down the engines. Yes, please, next. Thank you. Yes, Mildred Tate. I've also you, uh, provided an image of Mildred Tate. My co-author, Kenneth Walters, has provided similar images. I believe he's provided her remittance slips for you to look at. But I just wanted to catch um, what happened here, why she decided to go. Again, nothing to do. Would someone like to read again, Sylvia? Yeah? And this is, by the way, this is this, once you arrived in England, you took a photo and sent the picture back. Very few individuals had photos of themselves while they were in Barbados. So our collection is filled with photos like this. It's posed, it's within a uh, studio as this one, yes. First thing I done, I carried water at the Spencer's because my uncle said to me, now what you can help to do? What you gonna do? And I said, I don't know. So he said, he, Vivian Lane, was everything at Spencer's, so he said, that's it, the girl that carrying the water is the same age as you, and if she could carry water, if she could carry it, I could. I, I believe there's another one. Um, oh no, yes, no. Well, I'll speak to the other one. I've included that to bring a memory of enslavement and what happens in Barbados after emancipation. That would be the job. Someone's job, and usually female, was to take water to the workers in the field. And this lady went on to work in many factories in the UK, but in Barbados, what she was put to do was to carry water for a living. So again, speaking to the opportunities provided. So this then gives a wrap up of what we had discovered. Females, we found that the jobs that they were um, employed at in were carrying water on the plantations. We had two individuals that spoke to carrying water, either caning shears or working in the canteen or working in the laundry. We do have seamstresses. We have someone who was a teacher and who was also training as a nurse. For the males, we found that there were carpenters, tailors, joiner, perhaps Buddy might have been the tailor there, joiner, teachers. But again, many individuals said there was no work. You've got to pick here and a pick there and you did bits and pieces of work. So you're prompted to migrate. Next slide, please. Now, why do you migrate? This is a very strident voice that recalls what we've all heard, 
that actually there was a culture of being British, having learned about the British norms and British mores, mores, and therefore they migrate because we were taught about the British Empire. Places like Australia, Canada, Britain were the main places that we read about. I can remember we had a book called The Empire Overseas, and that gave a great deal of the whole of Canada, Australia, and very little of the West Indies. But the majority was around England, then came Australia and Canada. I don't think it had a full chapter on the whole of the West Indies. That's a colonial education there. Dan is the van in the van. Next slide, please. Female voice, would someone like to read this? Male can read it? Yes, thank you. My friends were all emigrating to England on that Mrs. Griffith scheme. It was a nursing scheme where they would get school leavers, young girls, to go to England to work in various hospitals. So my best friend at that time went up on that scheme and as we were buddies, the first letter I got from her, she said, come down and work, it's just like Barbados. So she really wanted to get me up there. We were such good friends. So as soon as I got that letter, I wrote to my dad and I said to him, I would like to come. My mother didn't approve at the time. She thought anyone was tough and rough, but I said, yes, I still want to come. So my dad sent me the money. Yes, thank you. Some of our respondents have said that sometimes the letters did not speak to the reality of what they were experiencing in England. They encouraged individuals to come without saying, well, actually, we're going through racism, they're teddy boys, or the work is hard, or we can't find accommodation. It was sugar-coated what was actually happening in England. So when we read it, she says, yes, it's just like Barbados. Immediately you think of the weather. Yes? <laughs> Not like Barbados at all. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the question of payment. She says she went on her own. I used to raise stocks and every kind of thing to help with my children, cows, pigs, sheep, anything. So when I was leaving to go to England, I sold everything. I gave my mother the money so that she could see about the children until I could send back. And she eventually sent for, so there's a sent for generation, she sent for her children to join her in England. Next slide, please. And this is the male voice, $365, and there was no way at that time I could afford it. So I had to sign a bond, and there was a gentleman called Mr. Bisfam from Carrington Village, he said, the way how you get on around the place, I would sign anything for you. And I paid a small deposit on that bond, and the government provided the balance, and I had to sign a paper that I would repay that. If you remember, Buddy says that he was self-employed, and you paid your own way to England. Is that it, Buddy? No. No. The government, uh, the government paid for you to go to England, to work on the buses. That's it. Right. So, Anyone else has a story of their family? Did someone travel to work on the buses in England? Or travel as a nurse? Yes. Yeah, my dad traveled to England to work on the railways. Yes. This was in the 50s? 57, I think. 1957, thank you. Someone else, another story to share with us? My dad is a good story. Your? Sorry, my dad. Mm -hmm. In 1962. Yes. Anyone else? Yes? I, I have a question which may be really stupid, but I don't care. Um, you say the government will pay for them to go up. Which government? Oh, Britain. Britain. The colonial government. Because <laughs> the Barbados government, yes, yes, but they were British citizens. <laughs> yes, and you had to pay when you returned. Sorry. But you did go up on a British passport, which is the one of the acts of when rush now, that many individuals left as British citizens traveling on a British passport, which was issued to them sometimes the day in which they took the exams. They went straight, got their passport, and would gather and leave. Yeah? All right, yes, please, next one, thank you. 
So, how do you get there? Well, if it's before 1960, it's highly possible that you went by boat. And I know the name Windrush is synonymous with traveling, but in the Eastern Caribbean, Italian boats are the boats that took many of the migrants over to England. And we found the Lady Drake, that's where our gentleman went when he was traveling to England to join the World War effort. He also traveled on the Mauritania. But the Franca Sea, some individuals went on the Franca Sea. The Hubert, we have a photo of the Hubert, the Luciano or Luciano, but the popular boat for Barbados was the Sorrento. How many persons have heard of the Sorrento? One person in the back? Two persons? Apparently it was quite, thank you, in the back as well. It's quite an event, a cultural practice arose of dressing and going to watch persons depart to the Sorrento, to take the Sorrento Sunday afternoons, Saturday afternoons to take the Sorrento. That became a cultural practice. Um, does anyone remember, um, sir at the back, was it a member of your family who went up on the Sorrento? Who was it? Sorry? My uncle. Your uncle traveled on the Sorrento. Thank you. Anyone else? Or any other boat that we don't have listed there? I'm still gathering names. Okay, so definitely the Sorrento is the most popular. Can we have the next slide, please? And this is the gentleman who left in 1954, whose suitcase I actually have in my office. I left Barbados late, I think around the 21st of December, 1954, and I felt elated when I was going to England. But the night I went down to the harbor, I was low, very low, especially when they put me in this small little boat to take me out to the bigger boat. The water was actually coming over the side and I felt as though we were going to drown. Anyway, anyhow, thankful we got on the ship, which was the Luciana, and the push off was, I think, in the region of 11, 12 o'clock. So departing at midnight just before Christmas. Next slide, please. There's an interesting story behind this. This it was a postcard that was to be posted to the mother of the person who was traveling. Thankfully, she's kept the postcard all these years. And so we've included it in the text. So on the other side, I see um, the person who worked with us for photography would remember that on the other side, there is a note to her mother that can be seen in the text. Hi, Russell, thanks. It's nice to see you here. Yes, that's up here. But you could also travel by plane. When we got to England, we went by plane, a little two liter engine, something that we thought we were going to drop in the sea. I was sitting behind the wing and you could see the sparks coming out. Oh boy, we're not going to reach there. Right, did anyone travel to England by plane? Those who said that they migrated, Theo did. By plane, what are your memories of BOAC? Similar? Sorry? Oh, you had a good journey on your plane, yes. Um, did you have a good journey? Okay. So, Theo, do you recognize this or you had a good journey as well? You went 1970, so this was early days with the propellers and going. Many of our, our interviewees spoke of this, propellers, the noise, the fact that they weren't sure. At one stage, it would actually go through New York on its way to London, so it was a very long, a very arduous journey. Can we have a side, please? Sorry? Yes. And landed where? Because the Azores is definitely the boat way, but yes? You went via the Azores, yes. Anyone else has memories or have been told stories of how their family members arrived in England? Plane? Sorry? Via Bermuda, yes. On BOAC, yes. Anyone else? Let's share. I hope we're recording this because these are part of the memories that we're collecting for the, next, for the following volume, yes? Okay, let's see. 
And I believe this was shown by Mr. Um, Walters when he did his presentation on the journey, but it's a lovely photo. We received it from the Government Information Service. These ladies are off to Lancaster. As you can see, there's a note there. They're leaving Sewell. And this is the, these are the early days when no one quite was sure or was informed as to what was required to travel. So many of our interviewees speak of how cold it was when they were arrived, how they were not prepared, they didn't have coats, etc. But these ladies are very smart. If you remember Sewell Airport before, before it became Gratley Adams Airport, I, I can remember as a child, you could look out and see persons who were departing. Yes, you remember this shot? Yeah. But this was many early days yet. Yeah. Um, thankfully, someone made a note, they're leaving terminal building at Sewell. It's a nice shot. Thank you, GIS. You were told England was just like Barbados? Oh, yes. They're dressed quite smart. Sunday best, stockings, etc. But those of you who have migrated or have returned would understand. We'd hope that this was the height of summer. It's highly possible it wasn't. And sometimes summers are just as cold as can be. Can we have another slide, please? So points of arrival, yes, you can, if you're going by boat, you go through Genoa, you take a train to Calais and a ferry on to the UK, or you may arrive at Folkestone, Plymouth, Dover, Liverpool, or you will arrive at Victoria, Euston, King's Cross. If you go by plane, you arrive at Gatwick, and one of our interviewees says she arrived as a child and she just remembered so many people at Gatwick. She was only eight, and a number of people had come to welcome various families, so she remembers the noise and the chatter that was in Gatwick or in Heathrow. And we do have this lady who took the most circuitous route, was flown to Ireland, and then went from bus through Ireland, then took a ferry, then took a train to Euston, London. It took four days once she arrived. It's very unusual. Yes, please. Now, as I said, I have a suitcase in my office. Can you remember your suitcase? Does anyone here have a suitcase? Or the grip? Or the trunk? The valise? Okay, valise, grip, trunk. Yes, Margaret has one. What's the color of yours? Sorry? Your, sorry? You have your father's trunk. Big thing. Yes? Who else? Does anyone else have a grip? suitcase some part of the journey I have a friend who has her suitcase she was sent back to England as a child and it's pink and it's in her loft in England yes I've heard that they're powder blue as well there were many colors and of course the ubiquitous brown any memories there so this person says, I remember unpacking my suitcase. I still have that suitcase. It was a small blue suitcase with two white stripes down. And my brother had put my name on it for me, a white paint. <laughs> my mom had taken me to town and she had bought me material to make me some flannel pajamas because we were told it was very, very cold. So I had two pairs of pajamas and underwear and I think a couple of changes of clothing and shoes and whatever I was wearing underprepared unfortunately very underprepared can we have that slide please preparation for the sea many individuals who took the ship speak of the seasickness they were not told of the seasickness but of uh, being sick at sea but as it got later in the process of migration the word was spread so this individual they tell me to get these tablets I went to Noel Roach, which is a pharmacy, and buy some tablets and took one before I get on. And one after the boat moved off and I was never ill. So I could see everything. Um, but some individuals have memories of being sick for the entire journey, not being prepared. You see, Dr. Watson, you're indicating something? No, I'm just mentioning that Noel Roach was my great uncle. Okay. Your grandmother was a roach. Where was this pharmacy then, Dr. Watson? Oh, some people, some individuals are saying where it was. The building is still there. Spikestown. It was 
So my like cousin Adrian, when he got old, the mountain. Okay. Does anyone else know this old building, Mr. Roach? No, yes, we have the north, the pe persons of Spike Sung of the north know. I wasn't aware it was in Spike Sung actually. Thank you very much. Yes, anyone else knows it? So you remember as a child, Noel Roach? Yes, Sylvia? Noel Roach? Well, we weren't aware of the family connections to Dr. Watson, but Noel Roach was a popular space. Partly in the 50s and right through. Thank you. I can tell you something. No, Obia. Yes. Obia. No, we'll wait on the lady. But you've raised it now. Did your, did your uncle um, handle other tablets? <laughs> Distribute? He sold many things. So, if you, like a lot of country people, if somebody did them something and they wanted to get back, they would go down to the hotel and he would go down to the back and he had vials of different colored water. Did you just be how you nodding? You saw somebody that you liked and you, it was like a form of what you were messing with called commandment powder. You know, and he, it was like a love, love potion. So you could, so these potions, these different colors symbolize different things and all the country people knew exactly. You could not give somebody a green potion and say, go and sprinkle this in the cocoon of the gentleman that you like, and you're going to get married next week. He would say, well, Mr. Lord, in any green thing I want, I want the red thing. But the red thing doesn't really work. So there you have it. Carl, you should see individuals behind you going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> You really are of an Obia family then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Collecting the memories. So we have to speak to these cultural practices in Barbados. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Yes. So the question of what was it like when you arrived? Would someone like to read this? This is someone who lived in the north. Or do I read it? I read it. Imagine you leave this nice warm climate and in the north where the temperature is far colder than the people in the south. I mean, I didn't know that at the time, so they figure it was a good thing that I didn't know that. But when you wake up mornings and you look outside and everything white, and when you step up there, the teeth knocking, your knees knocking, you know it was not very pleasant. So this point of the weather keeps coming up, coming up, and there are many, many examples of this in the text, there's even a lady who remembers that the buses in London, when it was a foggy, a foggy day in London town, the conductors would, would walk in front of the buses with lanterns, lighting the way for the drivers to drive. And in the midst of this discussion, she broke out laughing, said, can you imagine the conductors walking in front of the buses? So we've captured many of the cultural practices of the times that were discovered by our individuals when they traveled. Yes, can you have the next slide, please? And when, oh, this is the same individual. When you get home on evenings, that was just as bad because although you get into the house, the house was still cold, and you had then to try and get the fire lit to get some warmth. Some evenings, that cold would not light no matter what you do. Yes, next slide, please. Another time I was approaching a house that I saw, I decided I wouldn't phone. I saw a flat to let, but I didn't get any further than the bottom rung of the steps. Because this is what she had as an advert in the window, a notice. No Irish, no blacks, no dogs. So I thought Irish equal black equals dog, or dog equals black equals Irish. I have never been back to, yes, and I lived with a couple of English people until I strove and strove and sacrificed until I managed to buy my own house. Again, this story is one of the seminal stories of migration, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs, that many of our interviewees faced. Can we have the next slide, please? Then the paraffin heaters. There are many stories of these paraffin heaters. Do we know what we're referring to? Before that, we had what we call paraffin heaters. And when you come in in the evenings, outside so damn cold, you got to go quick, quick, 
take off your clothes on like this thing. Puff, 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 puff. And if you do not have a lot of mutter, mutter, we couldn't understand it, and thing, your clothes and things smell stink of this paraffin. That was in the 60s into the 70s and things like that. When I was living in the hospital, I never had those problems. You had central heating everywhere you go. Where you live out and you don't get a proper house, you end up having to heat it however you may. Who knows this paraffin? Because I heard someone said no. Is someone who, was it a younger voice who said, we do it on the paraffin heater? I'm, I'm seeing Margaret nod. There's a lady be, uh, behind you who doesn't know of the paraffin heater. Would you like to explain your experience? Okay. Did it before? Yes. So cold. Yes. Has anyone else heard of these stories of the paraffin heater and struggle to keep your flat cold or your room cold? Yes. Yes, buddy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the story keeps coming up, coming up, and I believe there are some groups in England who have captured, who have actually collected these heaters, as well as iron combs, if you remember the combs, so you would place the comb on the parfait heater to heat up, to press the hair. So I've seen photographs of five heating combs that have been gathered. I am not aware if we have any in Barbados. If you know of anyone who does, please let them contact the university. I'll be welcome, welcome to take them off their hands. Yes. Can we have another one, please? Oh, but I think a lot of people, this responds, this speaks to what we spoke of earlier. But I think a lot of people who came down when they wrote their families, they make them believe that life was in heaven instead of giving a balanced picture. So people believe that their family was doing far better than what we were, they were. Little white lies, and if you were someone who would quite clear to tell your family some of the problems that you faced, it was impossible for them to believe you. The truth is that they were smelling hell, and some of them hardly had anywhere to live, but the family wouldn't know that. It's the stories that, of what's happening in England not being fully communicated to those who are here in the Caribbean. Sometimes then some of our voices have said, it's expected that when you return from England, you come back with a lot of money because it seems that individuals who are doing so well in England, they fail to comprehend it was quite a struggle to live and endure and collect those remittances. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes. 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 Can you hear Dr. Watson? We, oh, um, Carl, would you share at the microphone, please? Because this has been raised. I've, I kind of squished my slides because of time, but this has been raised by many of our interviewees. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm just one the point of the difference in attitudes to hygiene. You know, I said we are a people, we live once a day, sometimes twice a day. But we don't know a day without day. When you get up in England, it's a different story. And I will tell you, I had a cousin who went up to England to do nursing in the 1950s. And she went to live with an English family. And she caught, managed to get a long distance call, which was very difficult in those days. When her father, my uncle, were sitting out in tears crying when she wanted to come home. So when my wife said, well, it was, um, why, what happened? She said, you would not believe these people. Look, they have a tub every Friday to fill it with hot water. And if man goes and bathes, and then the wife goes and bathes, and then the five children go and bathe, 
But then I go bed and I stick in water. More me. We, we've had, was, has anyone else had anything else to share? Because this is something that we always hear comments on. Yeah? I went to, I went to study at the University of Warwick in 1992. And because I was coming as a student from the Caribbean or an international student, they gave me one of the new rooms and these rooms had showers. And I thought, yeah. Okay, but actually it was a major step because other residences in the university had tubs and Caribbean persons who were in those residences would walk with Ajax, Vim, Clorox. <laughs> <laughs> Caribbean people were very aware of we have to clean the tub because it was a communal tub for a number of people. So yes, quite, quite rightly, we do have different hygiene practices that arose over time. And sometimes walking to the communal baths once a week, the bath might be down the street. Sometimes the bath was out in the coal and therefore you would think twice. And of course, then there was the cowboys that you took at the sink with the basin. Yeah. Can we have the next slide, please? Yes, I just want to quickly speak to remittances. Mr. Walters, I know, has taken you through the remittances, but this voice captured an interesting story. When I first went into nursing, my first pay packet was eight pounds, 12 shillings, six and a half pence. I still have that pay slip. Eight pounds, 12 shillings, six and a half pence. I hadn't got a clue what this half pence was, but that was it. I thought I was the richest person and I sent home four pounds of that to my mom and every month until my mother died, I sent home money to my mother. I would have that letter written in my handbag and as soon as I got paid, at the end of the day, I would buy a postal order and I would post that to my mom. Any memories, comments? Yes, please, share us. Please, could you stand at the... We stay at the microphone. We have individuals who are online listening as well. As someone who migrated in 1963, did you go through the experience of... It's just there. Yes, because... Thank you very much. We have an online audience that's engaging with us as well. Thank you. You migrated in 1963? I went, I went up to nursing as well. I was living in the north. Uh, so I, we didn't have that many hardships because in the nursing home, we had central heating. And, you know, unless you go out to other homes outside of nursing, you didn't realize how cold the houses were. But, plus I also sent money every month home a little. We didn't have very much. We had to, most times we had to buy food because we paid for our food as part of the whole package, but sometimes the food wasn't very good. Well, we didn't like the food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had to buy you know, stuff. To, or if you were working and you had to miss your meal, your, if, if, say if you had to go to theater and you miss your lunch, you wouldn't have anything else for the day okay. until tea time. So it was, it was quite hard in the nursing, very hard. Okay, thank you. Yes, some of our um, interviewees have expressed that those who were in the nursing homes did not, as you say, struggle as, as much as those who were out with the paraffin heaters, etc. But those who went through nursing also, you may or may not have a, a sister, a nursing head who was, who liked West Indians uh, was um, made made space for you, made you welcome, etc. Sometimes those are issues of racism that popped up as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. For sh yes, buddy. I'm sure it's because I left in 1963, mm -hmm. and I had promised my mother if I didn't come back rich in five years, I would send for her because of the relationship. And I sent for her in 1966. But 
from the time I kept in the back of England, I never wrote my mother an empty letter, just like the person said. You always take out money for home and some other things which you set as your weekly pay. But the most important thing for me was having that commitment, paying back the government for the money that they advanced to pay and sending money home for the family. That was something that most of us did, most of us did. I don't know, very, very few people went to England and didn't send back money to either help the you know, siblings who go to school or something like that, but they did send back money. Thank you. As I said, I'm very aware that Mr. Walters, Kenneth Walters, has covered this extensively in a lecture. But I think when we're reflecting on the lessons to be learned, unfortunately, the stories of remittances kind of died out in the constructing the story of diaspora. So many individuals grew up with the five pound note, fully aware of the $24.80. That was it. From 480, 480, 480, the 480, sorry, the 480, not 24, the 480, but if times five. We have individuals who said they paid off the entire shopkeeper, um, the credit. We have individuals whose shoes were bought, etc. Those stories of migration have died out. We've put this exhibition up four times, and each time we've had someone who stood at the display and recalled particularly the home, sweet home lamps. Yes, that you would heat, illegally heat the envelope on to see what was inside and then seal it back, or that was a source of light. Yes, Ms. Dr. Watson, I can't read. Oh, I am being told to hurry up, and I do have a wrap up. Yes, please go, <laughs> I'm gonna hurry up. Yes, the completion of the journey, I really am near the end. I am Bar a Barbadian born here and grew up, so I did all right. Some people say I ain't going back to Barbados. I ain't do this, you can't live both here. But I never do that. I is a Barbadian, so I come back to Barbados and I regret it neither. Can we have the next slide, please? Phyllis, whom we've tracked right through for tonight, because I wanted what I get, and I come home in it, I went to get something better, and you get something better, and then you return to your country, in it. And as you work up there, you work to get to old age. What you ain't up there for? There is nothing up there for you now. Am I lying? Can we have the next slide, please? So these are a few slides, and then I have my wrap-up that speak to the process, again, of what must we reflect on with the return. Mr. Walters has gone extensively into this, but I wanted just to prompt some discussion there's, everyone spoke of a feeling of rejection on their arrival in Barbados, of a feeling of hostility. Whether those in Barbados, or it, it's repeated across the region, intend to reject those who have come home, there is this statement of rejection. Sometimes the difference of the accent is made up by those who hear it, um, there is this question of being accused of being mad because you've been to the UK or you've returned from the UK. Definitely many of our interviewees were accused of not belonging. And this statement of returning nationals, which I have a comment in, in my, for my final comment, it seems to, they intended to provide allowances for resettling, but the construct returning nationals seem to signal that you weren't here, you were coming back from somewhere which the, we hadn't captured in the narratives of the nation. And one of our interviewees says, there seems to be so much conflict with the returning nationals that I don't want to stand out or be a returning national. Can we have another slide, please? Yeah, so this question of born or bred, or born not bred, creating the narrative of belonging to Barbados, and in many countries, but we're looking specifically at Barbados, we seem to have developed a narrative that says I'm Bajan born and bred. So that somewhere along the line in the independent spirit, if you couldn't prove that you were bred here, 
then there was a question to what extent were you Bajan or were you Bajan enough? So many of our individuals migrated before independence and sometimes individuals will say, well, you don't belong here where you come from. Yeah. So I was reflecting on historical narratives of neither crab nor creole or not belonging, but one of my arguments is that the national border space creates boundaries of non-belonging. It creates spaces within spaces where you might feel as an insider, not being an outsider, or you're somewhere in between. There were a couple of individuals who were here last week who were born in England and have returned home to look after their family and sometimes are made to feel, well, they're not quite Bajan, even though they grew up in a Bajan household in the UK. Can we get the next slide, please? I think we're coming quickly to an end. So yes, so one of my challenges is when we are thinking of how do we construct the sense of Barbadian identity, is it that that Barbadian born and bred has been fed into the national discourse? Is it that we have created, we began creating an, another narrative identity, registering 1966 as an important year? Please be aware that many of those who migrated before 1966 were not aware or may not be familiar with the national anthem of now, have not gone through the school system where the national anthem is sung, the pledge is sung, see themselves and feel very Barbadian, but may not be able to demonstrate their belonging with the national anthem, might need to stand and sing with words on the page. Some interviewees have commented that the stares they are given or the looks they are given or sometimes comments in Barbados, you say the drop remarks. You see then, they're not really better, they don't even know your answer. So this question of belonging and struggling for the narrative belonging is what is coming across to us. And definitely there is a rejection of recent migrants and this question of challenges. This may be the final slide. Please go. Yeah. One of our migrants who at the time he returned in his 60s and in his 80s a young Barbadian said to him, so where are you from? And he said, look, I was born before all of you <laughs> because that young Barbadian was creating the construct of Barbados from having been born in Barbados and grown up in the independence period. So that narrative belonging we are still struggling with. And what's the question of, what is the meaning of bread? I'm a bread, born and bred Bajan. At the time I was utilizing this, I was thinking that this was Bajan, and then I traveled to Yorkshire, and there was this sign that one could buy, born and bred in Yorkshire. So there's a construct of national belonging with the bread. Yeah, okay, this is the final one, I hope. <laughs> so I'm gonna pick up the third one, questions of belonging. Are Barbadian migrants made as the other, not belonging, not citizens? Do they find themselves on the outskirts of the narrative of what's called home? And the final one I leave you to read on your own, but there was a migrant magazine, and that was the advice given at the end of the magazine, which quite disturbed me. But it seemed at the time to be what was needed. This is in the mid, near the end of the 20, 2010, something like that. Extend peace to your neighbors and fellow men and accommodate yourself to your environment. You did it in strange lands many years ago. It has been very challenging to present these findings now in 2019. Yes, it's been a very long process of collecting these memories, 15 plus years but I have learned so much and I have continued the process of research. I was recently in England in, the tw in 2018 speaking to individuals in London, in Reading, in Coventry, in Birmingham, individuals who have kept their passports and their tickets, um, who are willing to share with us and that will be coming in the following volume. First we finish this one. I want in summary to reflect on the following, number one, there is an urgent need to capture the memories of what we know as the first generation. They have memorabilia, artifacts, and yes, narratives that serve to fill the lacunae in the histories for Barbados and the Caribbean by extension. 
My experience has shown that we need to capture these memories both here in Barbados and in the UK. And I provide an example. One of my contacts in the UK notified me that someone was traveling to Barbados who was in their 80s. I tried to have the official UE cameras. It was impossible, so I took my, my um, iPad. Very interesting device, able to record everything. And we did what we said would be a preliminary recording. He was in his early 80s. His intention was to return in February for the celebration of his sister's 80th birthday. Just before then, I received word that he had passed. So I'm stressing the urgency of doing our best to collect as many of these narratives from those first generation. They are still here. And something perhaps I see that the government of Barbados intends to name next year as the year of the diaspora. Hopefully I can find someone who will say, yes, we really want to continue this process. We want to capture as many as we can. Notice how we had a, an entire discussion tonight on Noel Roach, because we captured the memories of spikes down many years ago. Second point, we must also recognize that migration was ongoing. For example, I've met Barbadians who left in the 1960s as young teenagers who see themselves as an unspoken red generation, not quite fitting in with the Windrush generation. Those who travel in the 60s sometimes say that the narratives of Windrush give focus to the very post, the immediate post-World War generation. But individuals like yourself, ma'am, traveled in the 1960s. And in conversations, these individuals have been advocating that we have to find a way of differentiating that group who came and who had to struggle as well in the 1960s with their environment. So many of these migrants left unsponsored and were unaccompanied as they began spaces, began their lives anew in spaces without other West Indians around them. Three. There is also what we call the sent for and the sent back generations who need spaces for their narratives. We have begun that research and hopefully that will form another volume because many individuals were sent for, I think in this room, yes, who was sent for? You can raise your hands quickly, I'm coming to the end. Sent for one individual raised a hand. Theo, were you sent for? By someone who was in England sent for you? No? <laughs> There's a lady there. You were born in England. Yes, we were also the sent back generation. I know someone who told me they were sent back. You were sent for? When did you, when did you arrive in Barbados? Oh, we were sent from here to travel to England. Yes. Yeah, that's sent for and sent back generation. There are many individuals who willingly or unwillingly found themselves on a plane or a boat to England where they were raised and at one of the places where we portrayed our findings a lady came very well dressed complete in high heels took off her high heels put them on the counter stood a kimbo and said i have never forgiven my mother for sending for me i was three months old and i said sorry did you say three months old she said yes and i've never forgiven my mother and as it seemed she was in her 50s recalling these memories but felt a certain distance from the family she knew in Barbados, from the aunts and the uncles, etc. And she found herself in a very cold, strange place in England. I, can, for, I continue to question the way forward with this task of collecting the memories. We have among us so many generations, so many stories to be captured. I reflect on what a member of the audience told me last week. The member of the audience is here. His suggestion should we create a mural for all to see. Do we capture these in somewhere that is very visual? Visibly remind Barbadians of these narratives? His suggestion, for example, was that we put the mural at the airport, but I'm wondering if there's some spaces, especially as we look towards the year of diaspora, that we can create works of art that capture these stories around many spaces around Barbados. And finally, migration and diaspora are at the heart of the narratives belonging in Barbados. We have to revisit such constructs such as returning nationals. As one interviewee says, I was here before you. I am aware that the construct returning nationals perhaps is a legislative one. I believe the construct arose from a document from the United Nations. So it's an actual legal term. 
But what has happened is that it's created otherness within Barbadian society, phrases such as them returning nationals, watch them, they don't belong, oh my goodness, they're different. And perhaps in the year of the diaspora, when we think of the narratives of belonging, and perhaps you can join in that discussion, encouraging those, as we love to say, the powers that be to re-examine that construct. The time has come to recreate the symbols and meanings of belonging in the country. When you ask someone that where they're from, sometimes you have a very long answer. Thank you. Mr. Roach. Well, can we have another round of applause? The letter was so interesting that I forgot my duties as chairperson or ignored them. I was advised that the letters can't go over an hour. Yeah. But Sorry. we have enjoyed this evening. And the most important thing is, I, I thought, the, the, the extent to which everybody participated. So it was like an experiment that worked in this concluding lecture of the 2019 University of the West Indies Barbados Museum Lecture Series that fittingly it was a communal effort led by Dr. Marcia Burroughs. And you see in my introduction I said we were in for a good time and we have enjoyed. Now ordinarily in the, in the way things operate we would permit a question and answer see, um, session but it's now 8 o'clock, and time has perhaps caught up with us. We do have refreshments. I would say, unless there's any individual with a burning question for Dr. Burroughs, I would entertain one question. Before then, we would bring the proceedings formally, and anything else would be conducted over drinks. I've also been asked on behalf of the museum to remind you, given the importance of this whole issue and, and area of, of research of migration and all of the, the connecting points that Dr. Burroughs brought up this evening, I've also been asked to indicate to you that the museum's assistant curator for social history, um, Natalie McGuire, is there, you can by appointment. If you have any personal memories of migration or if you know anyone in your community or any relative who would have information relevant to this whole process of recapturing the memories of migration, then you could call the museum, speak to um, Natalie and make an appointment and share your personal history. So, Again, thank you so much for coming to the last of our ongoing lecture series. Please come back and support us again next year in 2020 when we will, of course, conceptualize and come up with another area of endeavor that our academics and invited guests will continue to explore for all our mutual benefit. We've learned so much this evening. As Marcia said, there's so much more. Um, to be learned. So, is there anyone in the audience who really has a burning question? I would allow one question before we go and then I, imbibe. Um, it's not a question, again, from the social media desk. We have someone who wanted to make a contribution a little earlier in the lecture, and this is from Claire P. Claire, can you please repeat your question? She says, my mother, brothers, and sister went to England in the 1950s. When they returned for a vacation, they told us of racial problems and how the Jamaicans defended them. My uncle posted small parcels to St. Vincent and the Grenadines for his nieces and nephews. So she wanted to make that contribution to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And again, as, as Dr. Burris pointed out, that whole issue of, of race and the, the, the difficulties, the, um, 
I, I myself, I spent a year in England doing research for my PhD, and, and even at that point in time, there were still those infamous signs, and not just in England, you went to the United States and in Boston and in North American cities, you would see them in boarding houses, Roman, Roman houses. No Irish, no blacks, no dogs. I, I want to share something very personal with you all. I, as a young man, I left there in 1968. I went to the University of Florida. It had just desegregated. I was among that very first group of West Indians who went up there. And um, two weeks after I arrived, the head of my department called me in and said, he was very embarrassed, um, but it was like a bit of a disappointment. I said, well, am I not performing well academically? And he said, no, no, you're doing very, very well, but you are not what we expected. <laughs> and I knew what he meant, but I tortured him. I said, well, what do you mean, Dr. Carter? What did you expect with me? He said, well, <clears throat> I had all my hair back then. We didn't expect a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Barbadian. And he explained to me that for every black student they recruited, they got matching federal funds. So he said, you know, we have you as a Negro, and we will change the designation. And I said, Dr. Carter, I'm proud to be a Negro, so please keep me as a Negro. And I still have my ID card that says Carl Watson, race Negro. And, and I will end by saying this. My biggest cultural shock up there, two weeks after I got there, I went to drink water from a water fountain. And as I bent down, I noticed that it was a sign that had been unscrewed from the wall and had fallen on the ground. And when I looked, the sign said, whites only. And there was another water fountain a little way down, and I, being a Bajan and being gypsy and malicious, I went down there and I looked, and so true, there was another sign on the ground that said, for coloreds only. And that was horrifying to me, coming from this island, where regardless of how you look, if you walk down the road and you're thirsty, and you knock on somebody's house, they will give you a glass of water, or sometimes, if you feel good, they will invite in the front house and send somebody to cut a coconut and give you some coconut water to drink. So the idea that as a central uh, an, an item of absolute necessity as water could have dimensions of race, and separation color for me. That was the biggest cultural shock that I experienced as a young student in the United States of America. Anyway, we take a break and we enjoy our libations. I don't think there's any rum, but there's juice and stuff like that. So let's meet and continue the discussion. Unless you have any, any last parting remark, Marcia? Miss, I call her Miss Marcia here. Ms. Marcia, Thank anything you, you want to say? Thank you very, very much. We are honoring the request of those who shared their memories with us and we foreground their narratives. I could give you several theoretical constructs for what's happening. I only reserved a few in the end. But thank you very much for sharing your memories with me. Thank you. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you. So drinks are there in the back.